So, a couple of weeks ago, I got an email from the organizers of these talks saying that they had been struggling with finding someone to talk on the topic of ugly. And then they thought of me and my art. And there was the solution. So, I was a little bit taken aback, but then I thought, no, hold on. There are actually some ugly aspects of what I do. I work with metals. They are sometimes dirty, always heavy, quite frequently harmful. And I have had to, um, for instance, you know, when you're asked to disembark an airplane five minutes before departure because your entirely innocently packed art supplies trigger some kind of alert and they think you have sinister plans, that's not pretty. I've drilled into my knee. I've had to take sudden 45 minute showers because I splashed myself with very dangerous nitric acid. I have a band-aid budget that is crazy. And yet I think I have the best job in the world. But it does get ugly. Now there's another aspect of what I do that could be said to be ugly. The money aspect. Now, most of you here will agree that money is a useful thing. But of course, as an artist, you're not supposed to care one little bit, which is kind of interesting. Now, I'll get to that bit in a moment. First, I need to take you back to 1997, because that is where it all started. It was an ugly day in October, gloomy. We hadn't seen the sun for weeks, gray, and dull, and I was at art school, a wonderful place. We had been working with all kinds of different techniques and materials, and that one day I was heading into the metal workshop to get, I don't know, some kind of tool, a hammer maybe. And suddenly I found my first piece of metal that I had been using some weeks earlier for copper printing. Now, when you make a copper print, it's all about making indentations and grooves in the metal either by scratching into it or etching into it with acids so that you can then rub oil paint into it and have that transfer onto a piece of paper. So the metal was just a means to an end. But what happened was I found my, that, that first piece of metal that I had used for copper printing. And it was amazing. It, instead of just being shiny copper, with the grooves and text and patterns that I had etched into it. It had depth, life, glow, and I thought, I'm gonna make the best print ever. So, I did the whole process with the oil paint, I made another print, and it turned out that what I actually ended up with was exactly like my first prints. Because all those changes, they were in the metal. They weren't on top of it, they couldn't be transferred. And I was so disappointed, I stopped printing. But I also realized in that one instant, I have my material. I have found what I am going to work with. I was in love. And yeah, it hurt, you know, shoulder pains from cutting the hard metal. It got dirty and heavy and band-aids again. But you, can, you can't argue with that feeling. I was in love with it but I didn't want to settle just for what the material does on its own, lying in a metal workshop. I wanted to know more about how it changes. How can I push those processes? What can I do to age it, to, to nudge it in different directions? And that's not entirely easy because I'm a bit of a control person. I like to get from A to B, planning every step of the way. And it's just you can't. With a material that is so alive, it has a say in the process. So no matter what I do, I never ever get to be. But once in a while I get somewhere even better. So it's worth those frustrations and the failures and the wasted work because of the times when I get somewhere way better than I dreamt of because the material is contributing to that process instead of working against me. I also started working with copper, uh, apart from copper, I started working with brass and bronze, which are alloys containing copper. 
They change in different ways, but they share a lot of the fascinating aspects with copper. I use a lot of text in my work. All the colors you see are chemicals reacting with the metal. There's no paint there. Although after a long while, I felt like painting again. And to me, it was absolutely natural that I should pick up a piece of metal and paint on that. What would I do with paper or a canvas? So the female figures that you see are painted with oil paint straight on the metal. It is an intransigent metal sometimes, a material sometimes. It, it doesn't necessarily want to go where I go and that, that gets ugly. It comes at a cost. But it's so compensated by, because I have that strength, that solidity in my work of knowing what I am passionate about and how I love that metal. So um, I went on to study. Um, I studied architecture before art school. I studied archaeology after art school, focusing on how metals change over thousands of years. Um, I went on to actually become a bronze caster. I don't cast anything in bronze now, but it was useful to get that metallurgy, to get a bit of chemistry, to get to a point where I thought, okay, I have the building blocks. So in 2001, I started as a full-time artist. I thought, okay, I have gotten to a point where I can throw myself out into this. And of course, I'm supposed to just create art all day long at my studio, not care one little bit if it sells or not. It's just, you know, artists also, well, you might not believe this, but some of the time we do actually live in the real world and money does matter because at the end of the month, it's a basic equation. Money has to come from somewhere. So unless you marry rich, inherit a fortune or win the lottery, then the money has to come from your art if that is what you want to do full time. And I did. Now, it wasn't just about making money, because let's face it, there are easier ways to go about that than becoming an artist. But money does actually matter to the art. Not just for me, so that I can pay my rent and put food on the table, but so that I can spontaneously go with an idea, so that I can get whatever materials or tools or expensive machines that I need right then and there, and just go with the creative flow and not have to wait until it can be financed. So money helps me say yes, but it also allows me to say no. Many years ago, I had an exhibition that did really well. Solo exhibition, huge job, did tremendously well and left me with a stomach ache because the gallery owner and I just, we didn't see eye to eye on a, on a couple of trust issues. And um, several years later, when she asked me to come back, repeat the success, I said no. I could afford, at that point, I could afford to say no, and I felt rich. Because I thought, here I'm actually safeguarding my art, my creative drive, that chafing stomach feeling that you really want to avoid. I could afford to say no. So, in a nutshell, basically, I think that profitability is absolutely brilliant for artistic integrity. So there I was, February 2001, starting my own company. Straight off the bat, I had my own credit crunch. I was working nonstop, making no money. And I thought of what my dad said. He's always told me, the human body is made of 72% water, and the rest is pure will. Now, I think my boyfriend will testify to the fact that as far as I'm concerned, that that is true. And that's useful, having that determination. Not going into it saying, well, I'm going to be an artist, and of course you can't make a living off that. Yeah, well, with that attitude, of course you can't. So I knew two things. I knew that, one, I wanted to make a living full-time working with my art. And I wanted to do it without compromise. I wanted to do exactly what I wanted to do, because otherwise, what would be the point? Okay. 
And number two, well, that was number two, sorry. The no compromise bit was number two. And I was extremely successful in one of those things. There was no compromise whatsoever. I must confess there was also no money for a very long time, working 80 hours a week. And it's not just time flowing out, it's money, it's energy. It's just one way, because what you're coming back the other way is tiny. I, in a sense, I had two full-time jobs. One full-time job at the studio, creating my art, and another outside the studio with all the work surrounding my art. Because I realized a key thing early on it's not enough to be good enough. A lot of people are, a lot of artists are good enough and don't make a living anyway. So I realized it take, took more than that. Now, in the end, I did make it. And I'd like to share with you a couple of the reasons for that. There are many, but just hit on, on a few points there. I think that one key thing is that at the studio, it is only about the art. But once the artwork is finished, looking at it with a bit of a strategic eye, where should this go? Should it be part of a gallery exhibition? Should it be on Facebook? Perhaps in my next newsletter? Do I maybe already know a previous client that I think could be interested in it? You know, applying a little bit of strategy after the work is finished doesn't affect whatever artistic value it might have. It is very important that, to me, it has never ever been about selling. It's been about communicating. You're not pushing your art on anyone. The desire to buy it has to come from them. But that can only come if they know what you do. So, to me, Communication has been key in a number of different ways. For instance, having professionally printed materials. Things are not just what they are. They are what they seem to be, to some extent. So coming across as professional and being able to present something that looks good makes a difference. They say that creativity without strategy is art. Creativity with strategy is marketing. So I tried to apply the same creativity that I, I applied to my art in the studio, I tried to apply to marketing it outside the studio. Second key point is professionalism. As an artist, you basically have carte blanche to be totally bohemian, weird, laid back. And, you know, you can go with that. You can just say, yes, I'm going to be an artist. I don't have to wash my hair. I can show up in dingy old clothes. I can behave weird. I can, instead of sending an invoice, I'll just scribble some numbers on a napkin. You know, you could. But I figured, why not turn that around and instead say, ha, huh, quite easily, just by trying to have my act reasonably together, I'm already a step ahead. Because I think that, okay, at the studio, yes, I am that bohemian artist who, you know, can look for half an hour for where she last put the hammer and not have a clue what day of the week it is, admittedly sometimes even sign the wrong year to a work of art. I'm just, it's all about the art. But outside the studio, when somebody wants to give you their hard-earned money. I mean, there's been a case, for instance, where I've gotten a quarter of a million Swedish kroner in advance. That, that takes a level of trust. And I think in that situation, yeah, sure, there's a contract, there's a bank guarantee, but I do believe that in that situation, the people across from me want to give that money to the businesswoman not to the bohemian artist. Um, I once uh, was trying to get a commission for a big portrait from the then US ambassador to Denmark. And uh, trying to 
to, to get them to go for the full thing, um, $27,000, I wanted to really prepare. I wanted to show them what it could look like. I didn't have any money. I borrowed a laptop from one friend. I was going to borrow a projector from another friend, to blow it up, show them how great it could be. And uh, as it was time to go, I tell my friend who's helping me, showing me how the projector works, I say, okay, time to go. I, I need to be at their place in 15 minutes. And my friend says, ah, isn't it very artistic to be late? I said, yes, it is. It's also very artistic to not make a living off your art. And I figured if I want to break with the one stereotype, then it might be useful to break with the other stereotype too. And that has helped me. I also try um, to, to be consistent, to, for instance, I don't use my professional email address to send chain letters. I never send them anyway, but if I were to, it would not come from there. I have a Facebook page related to my art. It's personal. Yeah, I invite people into the studio. There's a behind the scenes look at things. There are half finished works. There's inspiration but it's not private, and there are no photos of my lunch. I try to keep that professional level. The thing is, a lot of people want their art to do the talking for them. And yeah, in an ideal world, I'd just be at the studio making my works, and they would then just sell magically. But once in a while, you do need to meet people. Even if you don't volunteer to go out and talk to them, I mean, there are going to be openings, there are going to be gallery events. And what some people don't realize is that in public, you are your art. On Dragon's Den, investor James Kahn said, a lot of people don't realize that people buy people first. And then they buy their ideas or their products. I've also encountered a lot of helpful people during these years. I'm happy to say I get the feeling you guys don't belong to that group. Because these helpful people want to tell you how hard it is. I think possibly the majority of them uh, work with some kind of creativity. Perhaps they're slightly older than me and haven't done as well as they thought they should have. So who am I to come and say that this is possible? No. Don't believe for a second that it's easy. No doubt you're all familiar with Jante Lagen, the law of Jante. That was thought out by a miserable Norwegian git who said that basically, don't think anything of yourself. Don't blow your own horn, ever. Well, you, you do have to a bit. You can't just sit there and think, oh, once I get to be good enough, journalists are going to come knocking, clients are going to just stand in line to buy my art. You do actually need to push it a bit. You need to be out there. And you need helpful, genuinely helpful people around you who want to help you, who believe in your success, who believe it's possible. The point is, at the time when I was struggling with these helpful people, I didn't have any proof that they were wrong. Basically, every week that I was working 80 hours and paying good money to do so, I was just proving them right. But I was determined to make it, and I believed it had to be possible. So being a part of a small network, in my case, helped a great deal. I also had support from friends and family, of course, but small network. Brilliant women who wanted to do a lot of things and believed it was possible and went on to prove it. it. Makes a big difference because it takes so much energy. And energy is gold. You need that for so many things. You can't waste it on also trying to push people and their negative predictions off you. I wonder what I could have done to skip those years when it was all a struggle. And honestly, I don't think I could have done much. Yeah, I made mistakes, unavoidable. But I don't think that there was one big flaw and or one realization later on that if I'd only got that to begin with, ah, oh, would have been easy. We have a Danish poet called Piet Hein who said, people so often forget the three T's, things, 
take time. I think I was doing a lot of things right, but that it simply took time for them to, to have effect. It just, I had to be out there for a while. I had to wait for the word to get around. I, I was working with something that was so different that to begin with, people were saying, oh, that's interesting, but um, what is it? And now people are saying, oh, brilliant strategy. You know, great thinking. You're doing something that, as far as we know, nobody else quite does. Well, first of all, no bright thinking involved. I just fell in love with a piece of metal in a workshop. Secondly, it was working against me for many years because it was so unusual. Now, of course, it's in my favor because there aren't four other people locally creating art that can be confused with mine. But things take time. I had that written in big letters in my studio for a long time, believing in that. Last key point, I think, is um, champagne. Always have a bottle of champagne in the fridge. Now, maybe I shouldn't promote alcohol. It can be a bar of really good chocolate or something else. In my case, it's a small bottle of champagne. Um, celebrate the successes, because it's so easy to only see where you want to go, that when you do manage something, when you do have, when you are successful, that's just, you don't even have time to look at that. You're just struggling on. No, you need to celebrate the successes. That also means that on a regular, ugly Tuesday morning, open the fridge to get the milk. There's the bottle of champagne. Just waiting for you to finish that work or to get that commission or, or for that surprise phone call that changes everything. You need that little reminder and you need to celebrate with people who genuinely appreciate your success, who aren't related to the Norwegian Jante guy. So there have actually been a lot of celebrations over the years now, I'm happy to say. I can spend much more of my time at the studio. There's still a bit of surrounding work, but now more galleries come to me, more clients come to me. I can spend my time just focusing on my art. And that is absolutely wonderful. It's been a bit of a snowballing effect. And it is sometimes hard to keep up with the demand, which course is a, is a bit of a luxury problem and I still do exactly what I want at the studio that has never changed so while commercialism may be ugly making a living off your art without compromise is simply gorgeous thank you